terrible. We started off with like a clickbaity thumbnail about coronavirus. Now I'm talking about Judy Garland getting fucked over by the Hollywood studio system of the early 1930s. Still. What is up, booktube? It is Monty. I'm coming to you today on a Friday with something of a little bit of a different video. Um, first things first, I have a little bit of a disclaimer. This video was inspired by a tweet by Mayana over at Mayana Reads. I'll leave a link to the, there's a picture of the screen cap of the Twitter tweet, obviously, um, that inspired this video. I'm going to leave a link to her channel down below in case you've somehow stumbled across my channel and have never seen her. Um, I don't understand how that would have happened, but anything is possible in 2020 as we are acutely aware of. Now, first things first, this is not meant to be like a very, you know, like it, part of it is meant to be very lighthearted, right? Like we're all out here trying to cope with things. Um, I've never done a recommendations video. I don't really feel that I've read enough things to sit down and like really recommend titles. Um, so a lot of these are going to be titles that I've talked about before. A lot of these, I think, are things that you would expect me to recommend uh, just in, like, a general sense. Um, now I just have, like, a video dedicated to those things to direct people to. I don't know if that's really going to be useful in my life. We'll find out. Um, but more importantly, really, um, <laughs> the coronavirus, let's stay safe out here. I am not a medical expert. All I can do is tell people to, like, stay calm wash your hands. If you don't need to be in public, don't be in public. Let's, you know, let's not try and get sick here. Like, so these are things that you can do by yourself at home. Get the audiobook from the library. Use your Libby app. I don't know what, if you have an Audible subscription. However you get books, okay? Like, I'm not going to advocate for you to buy things. If you, like, obviously in a time of a pandemic, I don't want people rushing out to like purchase books if there are things in their life that are more important for them to be purchasing. So also there is that. But these are all titles that I think um, if you happen to be in a position where you can stay at home for long periods of time and self-quarantine as the, the, the news is saying, um, I think these are going to be titles that would be well worth your time. And a couple of titles that weren't really worth my time, but if you're going to be stuck at home for two weeks, I think that you could get through them. And they might be titles that you've put off for one reason or another. So with all of the disclaimers out of the way, I'm going to go and get into this. I have on my phone a list of things. Um, there's like six or so categories, so there's going to be a lot of books in this recommendation video. This is going to be a little bit of a long video, I'm sure. So for the first category, I have two books, and I call them survival stories. But the two in this category are the first one is Life As We Know It by Susan Beth Pfeiffer. I think that's how you pronounce it. I, I didn't do any googling. Feel free to drag me in the comments. Um, this is a story about an asteroid that knocks itself into the moon, and this is the story. I think it's like a family of three. I think it's like a teenage daughter, uh, her little sister, and their mom, and they're dealing with this. I think it's like an upstate New York. It's, it's a little bit of a... I think this one is set rurally out in like the countryside somewhere, and obviously with the moon becoming closer to the Earth, its gravitational pull on the Earth is a lot stronger and so there's a lot of natural disasters and this is kind of the fallout of that. I really enjoyed this when I read it years ago and I think that you know while it feels like the world is ending uh, in our current situation I think that this um, I like I said I enjoyed this I think that it offered a a sort of speculative element that I hadn't seen done before um, so I, like I said, I really enjoyed this one. I think it's well worth your time to check it out. And the other book in this category is Beauty Queens by Libba Bray. This was very popular here on booktube years and years ago, back when I first started watching, uh, the community. And this is the second book by Libba Bray that I read. The first one was Going Bovine. I think Going Bovine is a little bit weaker of a book, but Beauty Queens, as we all know, is the story of a shipwreck of beauty queens learning to survive 
on an island. All kinds of antics, all kinds of craziness. There is some representation in this. I believe there was a, maybe, I think it's a bisexual beauty queen. There were some beauty queens of color. I think specifically they were of Indian descent, like from India, like an Indian American situation. Um, all kinds of interesting shenanigans wind up in this book. I really enjoyed it. Um, I know this one isn't for everyone, but I think that, again, it's it's that level, it's a survival story, but there's also a level of, like, absurdist humor that I think makes it a more palatable storyline in our time of uh, the situation that we find ourselves in today. The next category on my list, I'm going to start off by talking about the books that I don't own physically and then I'll transition into the ones that I do. And the first book on that list is... Actually, I'm cheating here. I'm picking a trilogy of things. I'm picking the Crazy Rich Asian trilogy by Kevin Kwan. I do think that Crazy Rich Asians can be read as a standalone. I don't think it's like a fully contained narrative, but I think that if you read Crazy Rich Asians and you decide that, eh, I don't really care to continue on with this story, you can. Like, you can just not go on to China Rich Girlfriend or Rich People Problems. But as a person who loves a messy storyline and getting to read about rich people doing messy rich people things that are in some ways completely unrelatable to my status in life, um, I enjoyed the hell out of this. I had a crazy good time. Uh, it was, well, like a lot of people, it was a series that I had heard a lot about before the movie came out. Then I watched the movie. I think that the movie does a good job of... Because there's like seven or so storylines going on in Crazy Rich Asians. And I think that the movie does a really good job of picking one main storyline, obviously the storyline with Nick and Rachel, and making that the center of a narrative and using that to explore just like traditional rom-com tropes and situations. But while watching the movie, my favorite character was Astrid. And so in reading the books... Uh, I got to see more of Astrid, and Astrid is still my favorite character. She has a very messy storyline. She is still the best. This isn't for everyone. I do recommend the audiobook of at least the first one. This is an instance where the first audiobook and the second two audiobooks are narrated by different people, and so for books two and three, I just read them physically, but Crazy Rich Asians as an audiobook was really good. I really liked that narrator. Um, and so I was just kind of sad when I found out that they hadn't been able to continue on with the series. But I do recommend them, the audiobooks, just because there are a lot of words. There are some words in Chinese. And I want to say it's like a regional Singaporean dialect that I forget the name of in the book. Um, and so having the, the narrator pronounce those words correctly um, was really great. And really informative and probably the best way to consume the book just 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 probably the next book that I want to talk about that I do not own is a raid that I talked about briefly on my channel and that was The Best Lies by Sierra Liu this is a sort of I don't want to say it's a thriller because you know there's a dead body like from page one and you kind of know who the killer is from page one but it's an unraveling of the events that led up to that happening and it's a very much a book about friendship uh, female friendship how this female friendship turned kind of toxic and exploring what that is like it kind of reminded me of that really old movie uh, that Nikki Reed did with Catherine Hardwick before Twilight 13 um, I watched that probably at an age that I should not have watched it, but it was really good. The plot lines are totally different. Like, nobody dies in the movie 13. I think it's about these girls who, like, get hooked on meth or something. It's, it's like I said, it's wildly different, but it's, again, this sort of exploration of adolescent female relationships, much like The Best Lies. Um, the Best Lies is also own voices for the Asian representation, and I think that it... Is, it's definitely one of my favorite reads of the year so far. Uh, I'm really sad that I didn't get to it last year, but if you're looking for that kind of a, a somebody is dead and we're going to explore how we got here type books, I think that The Best Lies is one of the best in that, in that category that not a lot of people have read that I've seen. 
Next is another recent read of mine. It is The Stylist by Rosie Nixon. In my wrap-up for, I think I read this in January, so my January wrap-up, I talked about how it's more like chiclet, general women's fiction type uh, narratives, even though it was kind of, I think the cover redesign pushes it more towards like your standard romance reader audience with the illustrated cover um, and the vector-based character design. But I don't think it's like that. It is very much a character-driven narrative about a young woman uh, who's from England who just happens to be in the right place at the right time and is now working for one of the most celebrated stylists. And the series of fuck-ups and misfortunes that befall the stylist that our main character has to deal with. Um, again, I really enjoyed it. There is a sequel to this one. It's called The Stylist Takes Manhattan. I personally wasn't interested in continuing on with the storyline. I do think that the stylist works and functions as a standalone piece of fiction. I haven't, like, I didn't read The Stylist Takes Manhattan, so I'm not saying it's a bad one. So it, it is an, it's another situation where if you like the first one, there is a second book out there. And if you are self-quarantining for two weeks, then a duology might be a nice situation for you to have. Um, again, The Silas isn't really a book I've seen a lot of people talk about. The next book is another book that I was surprised to enjoy, that I enjoyed it as much as I wound up enjoying, and that was Daisy Jones and the Six by Taylor Jenkins Reid. I don't really think I need to talk about this one. I personally really connected with the physical book, but judging based on me personally, I don't do well with full cast audiobooks. I don't do well with audiobooks that have a lot of sound effects. I don't do well with audiobooks that sound like productions of like things. Like I just want a narrator, one sing like two narrators, so there's like alternating perspectives. Um, that's fine. I'm okay with like one narrator per perspective, but the way that Daisy Jones and the Six is written, there's no way I could have connected names to characters to voice actors in an audiobook going two times speed. Like, I don't know how y'all are out here doing that shit. That's, that's the real witchcraft. Um, but I really enjoyed this book. I thought that it was a bunch of white people doing a bunch of white people things. Is there a conversation to be had about how they're all doing rock music and there's no discussion about how that's a stolen genre or her? how black people invented it and it was made famous by a bunch of white people. Like, no, that's like we don't examine that. But also, I don't want Taylor Jenkins Reid to examine that. Like, that she's not the author I want to examine it. So for what it was, I was really here for it. Again, there's a character, I forget what her name is. I think it's like, I want to say Monique, but I know it's not Monique because that's uh, Evelyn Hugo. Um, her last name is Jackson. Is it Michelle? I think it's Michelle Jackson. And she's our black character in Daisy Jones, and I think that her daughter gets fucked over. I think that Michelle Jackson's character in the third act kind of just becomes this character that exists solely to look after our waif-like Daisy Jones. I think there are still some problematic depictions of race in her book. Still, I enjoyed this one, and I think that it's a great thing to pick up uh, before the Amazon show comes out. Okay, the next book that I'm going to talk about that I do not own is called The Pact, A Love Story by Jodi Picot. I know that in the past I've talked about this book. It is the one that is about uh, two families who grew up next to each other. They have these children, uh, high schoolers. I think they're maybe juniors or seniors in their high school education, and the girlfriend in this couple winds up dead, and her boyfriend is placed on trial for her murder. And it's sort of the story of what really happened, the fallout between these two families, because they've always been very close. Um, and now, you know, one of the families believes that this boy killed their daughter, and how does that play out? And I remember being in eighth grade reading this book, and eighth grade Monty was so shook. It was the most dramatic thing that I have ever read in my entire existence on this planet. Okay, maybe not the most dramatic thing I've ever read in this, but it was very dramatic. It was, it, it, it fed my soul. And for a hot minute, Jodi Picoult became my favorite author. Uh, Jodi Picoult is sort of prolific. She has a lot of works out. So if you wind up really enjoying the Pact, a love story, 
I would also recommend books like 19 Minutes, although that one does deal with a school shooting, so trigger warnings for that. Uh, Change of Heart is sort of like a modern day Jesus, so there is a carpenter who was arrested, I think, for a murder? Or he was like, wrong place, wrong time. I forget the exact details of his situation. Um, but he is arrested, um, and he's in prison, and all of these sort of miracles start happening around him. Okay. Then there's the classic one, My Sister's Keeper, which deals with a young woman, I think she's like sixth grade or so, suing her family for medical autonomy because her older sister is dying of, I think it's leukemia she has. And so she, the younger sister, her entire life has been donating marrow for her older sister. Like her parents literally only had this, like their younger daughter because they weren't a match. And so her whole existence has been to give her older sister life. Um, and again, you get to see all of that play out. It's very intense. It's very, again, we're dealing with cancer. Um, so beware of that going in. But I think that Jodie Picoult writes the courtroom scenes really well. I think she writes character dynamics really well. And like I said, she has a whole backlist of other things that I haven't even read yet. So... Definitely recommend that if you're looking for some really hard-hitting, like, well-constructed contemporary fiction. The next one is what I like to call, like, crack... I, I really should have put this in, like, the crackpot category, but we're here in contemporary, and it's roughly a contemporary, and it is Inferno by Dan Brown. This is one of the Robert Langdon stories. Technically, I think it's book number four in this series, but I don't think you need to read them in any particular order. Inferno's on this list and not the other three because Inferno deals with an epidemic pandemic situation that I thought was fucking stupid. I thought it was the most world breaking shit I had ever read. It was the most crackpot of crackpot situations. And so when I heard that Origin book number five was coming out, I was like, sir, how? How do you have a book after after that last one? Like, his books have been, you know, they get a lot of heat for being, you know, just a bunch of crackpot theories sold out to people. Um, a lot of really poor writing, a lot of really, really short chapters that are really quickly paced that is questionable. Um... But again, I think that it works, and I think that if you're in the middle of an epidemic, reading about a crackpot epidemic might make you feel better. I don't know, but I know I had a good time. I also didn't read it during, you know, a massive worldwide pandemic, so there's that. But it, it's not like people aren't dying in this, like, people aren't like, it's not, it's not that. So, like I said, it's crackpot but no one is like actively dying. It's not a depressing situation. It's like, this is what we're doing. It has to be read to be believed, honestly. Next, I'm gonna talk about Keep This To Yourself by Tom Ryan. This sort of falls into the similar category that we had earlier, that we had earlier with The Best Lies, where it's not, this one is more thriller mystery because you don't know who the murderer is. We just know that before the events of the book, uh, four people were murdered, and the most recent victim was the best friend of our main character. And so it's our main character trying to find out who killed his best friend. And while I think that the ending is a little bit contrived, it's a little bit messy, Keep This To Yourself was still one of my most favorite reads of 2019, and I'm really sad that not a lot of people have read it, and I'm really sad that it hasn't gotten a lot of hype and attention much like The Best Lies. Um, Keep This to Yourself is own voices for the queer representation. Uh, it is, again, it has to be read to be believed. There is an African-American main character, like a love interest, an African-American love interest. I thought they were fine. Um, I am often hypercritical of black love interests in books, and so I'm trying to recal, like when I talk about them, I try to calibrate my thoughts in the sense like, are they actually a bad character or am I just being super biased? And I think that the love interest here, I think is actually really well handled. Um, and again, this book kind of, when I got to the end of the book, I was reading it 
I want to say it was right before, uh, like, a f I think it was right before Fierce Friday. Um, so I had gone to Six Flags, and I was sitting uh, down, and I was, like, furiously scrolling through my e-arc of the book for the last third of it, because I just needed to know what the fuck was going on, and how the fuck we were going to, like, unmask the killer. And when I tell you I was shook and shaken, I was shook and shaken. Like, go read it. And the last one that I'm going to talk about that I do not own is The Husband's Secret by Leanne Moriarty. I was tempted to put Big Little Lies on this one because I figure you could be able to read the book, watch the show, but honestly, I think you could just probably just watch the show. Like, I enjoyed Big Little Lies. I read the book and I tried watching the show, but I wound up giving up on it. Um, but... I think that Leanne Moriarty writes really well-crafted stories, again, really well-crafted characters. I don't recommend reading a lot of her books in a row. So I think if you pick up Big Little Lies, do not pick up The Husband's Secret immediately after. If you read The Husband's Secret, do not pick up Big Little Lies. I think that up until, like, Big Little Lies, The Husband's Secret, What Alice Forgot, all three of those share sort of very similar storytelling elements and story structures that I kind of regret having read all three of them back to back to back. I think if you want to read two of them back to back, you could probably get away with any of those three and then Nine Perfect Strangers. And I don't like Nine Perfect Strangers, but I think you could get away with reading them back to back because Nine Perfect Strangers is sort of set up differently than the other ones. Um, and so... It, I don't think you would uh, confuse the narratives as much there. So those are all the books that I think fit into my contemporary category that I don't have. And now we're going to move on to the ones that fit in that I do have. Okay, so like I said earlier, a lot of these I've already talked about extensively on my channel. So I'm not going to make you suffer through them again. So just quickly, the ones I've talked about, I think the most... Uh, the Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. I haven't talked about this a lot recently, but I do have a whole video review of these. I think I left that up. I might have taken it down. But we have our main character, Elizabeth Lander, who is a private investigator type situation person um, who was hired to find out who killed somebody. And that brings her into the radar of Michael Blumquist, who was also sort of similarly investigating this for, I think it's, it's a magazine. And um, this can be read as a standalone. Next is one of the more popular reviews on my channel, and that was American Royals by Catherine McGee. Again, very cutesy. Again, I think that this will make you feel better being stuck at home, trapped inside. I, I think it would. I personally would feel better having read this, being trapped inside. And the rest of these, I think, are also... Okay, so these other three, probably the ones I've talked about the most. So Emergency Contact, definitely don't need to talk about that one again. Uh, Permanent Record, if you haven't read this by now and you've been on my channel, like, how many times does it tell you to read this book? And Autobiography, Christina Lauren. This is the only Christina Lauren I've read, and seeing how every other Christina Lauren book is sort of, what is it, like, very mixed reviews, I have no desire to pick up anything else. But this one tells the story of Sebastian Brother, who is a Mormon living in Salt Lake City, and Tanner, who is moving there from the Bay Area, and there it's their love story. It's very cute. It hits me in all the feels. And then the two that I talk about probably the least is, it's kind of a funny story by Ned Vizzini. I think this is a great book. Uh, I personally really enjoyed it. I haven't, I think there's been a couple people who said they read this and they didn't like it, but... I don't see, like, it, I love it so much, so much. And then if I had to pick a story that I think is probably actually the messiest, most dramatic situation I've ever read, it is The Lie by Chad Coltkin. Again, eons ago when I first started my channel, I reviewed this book, and the video quality for that review is terrible. But if you want a... a this is technically an adult book, but it's set at a college, so if you wanted new adult vibes, you could say there's new adult vibes. I know there's been this argument that new adult is like a romance genre, and it can't really be another 
fit. And this is more like contemporary, even though the core of it, there is like a romance throughout it. But it's dealing with three friends, all four years of their college experience. One of them, it takes place in Texas. It's literally the most messy, fucked up book I have ever read. There is um, trigger warnings for definitely like sexual assault, very dubious consent issues, um, revenge, STDs, like fucked up shit happens in this book. And I need people to read it. I think there are a lot of people that I follow in the booktube community who would uh, enjoy, I don't want to say enjoy because it's, like I said, it's a fucked up book, but I think that there's a lot of people in this community that haven't read this book that I think having read it would uh, have enjoyed the, the ride and the messiness that this book is. Um, it's definitely Chad Colton's best written work. It's also his longest work, so there's that. He does have four other books, The Average American Male, The Average American Marriage, um, and Strange Animals, so I guess it's just three. Those are also really fucked up. They're also, Strange, strange Animals uh, deals with abortion, um, and The Average American Marriage and Male both deal with issues of cheating and infidelity, um, so those are things to look out if you decide not. Oh, and Men, Women, and Children, which was made into a movie. There was four. I just forgot one. Men, Women, and Children is probably his least um, misogynistic overtly, but there's also low-key pedophile vibes in that one where there's like a pageant mom who sells pictures of her daughter in like underwear. It's, it's weird. It's like a weird subplot that didn't need to be in the book, but was in the book. So... That exists. That's in the universe. But again, like, Men, Women, and Children might be his, like, least creepy, but there's also that element of the book. So, <laughs> there. Okay, next we're moving on to my nonfiction category, and I do not own any of these books. So, I'm just going to move through these pretty quickly. First up, I have Bad Blood, Secrets and Lies, and a Silicon Valley Startup by John Carreyrou. I listened to this on audio. I would recommend you to listen to this on audio, maybe while you're doing some cleaning during this quarantine, you know, rearranging bookshelves, while you're doing your Animal Crossing New Leaf. Uh, it's not New Leaf, it's New Horizons, right? That's the new one. I don't play Animal Crossing. I don't know these things. Um, but yeah, while you're doing all of those things to like distract yourself, you could be listening to some Bad Blood. Elizabeth Holmes has one of the most bonkers true life stories I've ever had to listen about. So she has that going for her. Shout out to her. Shout out to John Carey Rue. This is a well, I do recommend the audiobook. All of these, I think either the audiobook was really well done or I read it physically and I thought that it was easily accessible and wasn't like, I didn't have to trip over anything. Next up, I have White Negroes. This is my, I think this is, this actually took my top spot on my 2019 best books of the year. I will leave that linked up above just because I talk about some of these that I've already gone over just a little bit more in depth there in case you wanted like that to go with. But White Negroes, When Corners Were in Vogue, and Other Thoughts on Cultural Appropriation was a really well written book. I don't think it really brings anything new to the conversation of cultural appropriation, but I think that it really crystallizes and makes abundantly clear why it's an issue and why you are and why people get upset when it comes up in conversation and why it continues to come up in conversation. This one mainly focuses on the black experience and how uh, black culture, black American culture is often <laughs> mainstreamed into white culture and then just popular culture at large. Um, so do go into it with that in mind, like we're not it's not a full discussion of cultural appropriation, although we do talk on... I, I do think that uh, Lauren Michelle Jackson brushes on some other instances, but again, it's called White Negroes. It, it is coming at this topic, this conversation, from a black perspective. Next up on my list is Catch and Kill, Lies, Spies, and... What was it? Lies, Spies, and a Conspiracy to... Protect a Predator by Ronan Farrow. I just finished listening to this one two days ago now. 
this was a wild ride. I do want to say going into this, if you listen to the audiobook, I need you to be warned. I think it's chapter nine through 11, not the whole time, but somewhere in that, in that chunk of spine, I think it's really 10. I don't think it was as early as nine, but I wasn't really super paying attention at the time. But during that time, uh, there is an audio recording of Mr. Harvey Weinstein trying to get one of his uh, victims to go up to his hotel room and you hear his voice and it was the most disgusting thing I've ever had to listen to. I was so taken aback by it that I wanted to throw my phone out of the car. Luckily I did not do that but it was it was there. Obviously if you're just reading the book you'll see his, what he said but having to hear it come out of his mouth shook me to my core. There's also a lot of instances where there's like really random musical cues. In the beginning of the book, they seem to happen just at the end of a chapter, which is again, just odd. But sometimes towards the end of the audiobook, they would just kind of happen in the middle of a chapter. And I kind of thought they were trying to signal like a, a shift in like what we were talking about. But even when we were transitioning from what like Ronan talking to his sources or Ronan explaining something, there would just be these weird musical cues that had nothing to do with the black cube perspective of, of the situation. Um, the third act also really gets into just sort of a larger conversation outside of Harvey Weinstein. So we talk about Matt Lauer and uh, Leslie Moonves of CBS and NBC respectively and stuff. But, and I think that it was important to have that in the narrative, but the last third of the chapter just felt so... Even in the moments about Matt Lauer that were very specific, um, it still felt very general in a book that had been so narrowly tailored about Harvey Weinstein. It just kind of read like, we're including this to show that it's larger and that the impact of Ronan's story was larger and we can, and it's more than just this one person, which I appreciated, but I felt that the it, it just was a disconnect because we had spent like literally two thirds of the book chronicling everything there was to chronicle about this story. And there were just kind of like these pepperings of like, oh, Ronan Farrell was talking to Matt Lauer this one time. And you in 2020 know that Matt Lauer is a creeper who got fired from the Today Show. But, you know, Ronan Farrow in 2012 or whatever, he had no idea. Um... But again, I do think this was a really well-written book. I do think that it was a really well-done audiobook overall, even with those, even with the Harvey Weinstein creeping me out, and even with the musical cues, I think that overall was very successful, and I would recommend people to listen to it. Next up, I have Ladies Who Punch, The Explosive Story of the View by Raman Satuti. I read this last October when I was on my booktube detox situation, and I enjoyed it enough. The first half of the book is really well constructed. I think that the closer we get to the modern era of the show, the less explosive it is. I also think that Raman Satuti being close friends with Megan McCain, I think that it, it, it slanted his depiction of her in the book. I wouldn't say that I learned a lot, but I had a good time. I had a good time. And I think again, that it was pretty well written. Okay, so another title, the last science fiction title on my list is actually, it's more of a memoir and it's the Carrie Fisher memoir, The Princess Diarist. And I thought it was super, I think I read this after her passing. I listened to the audiobook, so it is Carrie Fisher. So that could be emotionally charged during our times and things, but I, I really appreciated it. It wasn't until I read The Princess Diarist that I actively decided I was going to go back and watch the Star Wars films. And while I think that the original trilogy is probably not my favorite, I am a prequel stan, as all people should be. But I think that it, it was what I needed <laughs> to get into the movies, but also just understand why people really loved Carrie Fisher as much as they did. Um, it was just a really good memoir, and it was really nice to have her read it to me, and I enjoyed my time with it. So I think that it was, of all of the nonfiction, um, of all of the things on this list, I think this is probably one of the, again, better 
picks for a self-isolating situation because it's there's a there are I think there's some talks of heavy topics, but it's it's never in a way that pulls you down as a reader. It always I think it's very uplifting. So next one is fantasy and science fiction. Again, we're gonna start with the things that I do not have physically, and first among those is Wicked, The Life and Times of the Wicked Witch of the West by Gregory Maguire. This is obviously the source inspiration for the musical Wicked. It's been running on Broadway for like almost 20 years. Um, obviously inspired by L. Frank Baum's uh, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. As a Kansan, I have to say that I am very attached to this particular property. Although I will also say that I could not finish the Wizard of Oz as a book was not entertained. Miss Judy Garland, I understand they did you dirty. <laughs> they fucked up your life. That was a good movie. <laughs> this is terrible. We started off with like a clickbaity thumbnail about coronavirus. Now I'm talking about Judy Garland getting fucked over by the Hollywood studio system of the early 1930s. Still. Good movie, Wicked, the book. I think this is a book, it took me a while to get into it. I had to read this book like three separate times before I finally was able to read it cover to cover and enjoy the material for what it was. And it's so good. I think it's, I think part of me resents the musical for what it does to the source material because the book is just so good and the musical is just so questionable by comparison, but it's, it's not it's the world we live in. It's the world we live in. Next is The Looking Glass Wars by Frank Better. This is more, I read it in elementary school, middle school, so I view it as like a younger read. But when I go to Barnes and Noble, and I don't see this shelved often, it'll, it'll pop in. Um, it gets shelved in the YA section. So I, but essentially, The Looking Glass Wars is what it sounds like. It is an Alice in Wonderland retelling where our main character is named Alice Hart. We see her in the beginning of the book. She is, you know, Princess of Wonderland where, you know, she's going to be queen one day because Wonderland is a queendom. Um, but her Aunt Red has something to say about it. Her Aunt Red was first in line for the throne. She was above her... Uh, Alice's mother. Um, but in this world, in order to become the queen, you have to go through the looking glass maze and claim your scepter. Um, and to get through the maze, you have to have mastered the magic system in this book, which is imagination. Um, but Auntie Red, she, she never quite managed to get through that maze. And so she couldn't become queen. And her younger sister assumed the throne. And she's out here living her life as queen. Um, and Auntie Red is like, bitch, this is my queendom. And so at the beginning of the Looking Glass Wars, she shows up with an army and kills her sister. And Alice has to flee. Uh, and the rest of the book is dealing with that. And Auntie Red is one of my favorite antagonists ever. I think she gets done dirty. She definitely gets done dirty over the course of the series. And the series does kind of like, get questionable by book three but se the second book seeing red we stand it we stand auntie red we stand miss red heart so i think that the looking glass wars definitely is some a plus material okay the last one that i'm going to talk about that i don't own or have a copy of is the merchant of death by dj McHale. this is the first book in the pendragon series and my good friend from elementary school got me into these so again this is a middle grade fantasy series that I don't think a lot of people have read. I haven't seen anybody talk about this series and I actually never finished it. This, like I said, there's 10 books and it's about our young protagonist, Bobby Pendragon, who was on a quest to save the multiverse. It's, it's very interesting. So uh, essentially you have Bobby who is sort of brought in to be uh, a savior for all of these places because the antagonist of the series is trying to tip the balance in favor of the evil situation in the book. Um, and Bobby is trying to go to these places. Be it's a, You could argue it's a little bit white savory. 
it's, it's a, when I say a little bit, it's very white savory um, in some of these planets, on some of these systems, and some of these timelines. But it is just so good. Again, I'm gonna leave a link down below to the actual description. Again, like this is a, a series where you get to follow our main character. At the beginning, I think he's like 14. At the end, he's like an adultish type age. Again, it's like middle grade, so it's like he might be 18, you know, 17, 16, but it's a middle grade, 17, 16. Um, and I loved this series so much. It was so good. Like, how how could you not like it? How, check it out. And like I said, there's 10 books. It's 10 books. If you're self-isolating for 14 days, middle grade, you can get through at least five of them. The last of the sci-fi books that I'm gonna talk about, I've kind of talked about already on my channel, so I'm not gonna go into them in too much depth. First up, The Martian by Andy Weir. This is, again is a situation where you could read the book, watch the movie, perfect for self-isolation. Uh, a River of Royal Blood by Amanda Joy. I think this is one of the best young adult fantasies that I've read in a really long time. I don't like that the sequel is from her sister's point of view. I think that's kind of why this one falls a little flat and why that character in particular is a little flat, but there ain't nothing I can do about it now. They both die at the end. Y'all know this made me cry. You know, I go, I go for this book even though it's probably questionable, but I don't care. Like, this is best Adam Silvera has ever done. <laughs> Steel Crow Saga. I said this is my favorite high fantasy of last year. It's st it still, it still is. I haven't read anything better than it yet. I mean, anything is possible. But it makes high fantasy so accessible. Its own voices for the Asian representation. There are queer characters aplenty. Read it. Get on it. Enjoy it. Next category of books that I have is what I like to call, like, it's very tongue-in-cheek. Very tongue-in-cheek. It's, uh, the end of the world. And so why the fuck not? Like, if the world is ending, you might as well read these books. And the first one I have on this list is Gone with the Wind by Miss Margaret Mitchell. I have read this. I have a review of it. I think that it is white propaganda. I think that nary a thing. I mean, there are a few things in it that are obviously historically accurate. Like, I think there's a depiction of Sherman's March to the Sea where we get to see Atlanta burn to the ground. happened so she got that but it very much frames the civil war not so much as you know the civil war it frames it as the war of northern aggression and so i think that's really all you need to know about this book i think the fact that there are plenty of covers with the lovely confederate flag emblazoned on it is all you need to know about this book i think that this book is billed as a great romance and Rhett Butler threatens to rape his wife. So Rhett Butler is a trash human being. You will not catch me standing that man. Ashley Wilkes, now that man, he might have been in the KKK, but he was he was he was a gay icon. And Melanie Hamilton, she also might have been supportive of the KKK, but again, we stand Miss Melanie. So there's a lot of questionable content in Gone with the Wind. And I don't really want people to read it because I think that it is what racist propaganda trash. But if it's the end of the world and you have to self-isolate for 14 days, why not Why not get a, a chunky classic off your shelf? Um, the other book that I have, I think, fits and pairs real nicely with Gone with the Wind. And it is docile. So that's all I'm going to say on that. And to end this on a happy, lighter note, I'm ending this on my graphic novel section. I only have two graphic novels. Originally I had three, but I think that I really want to talk about these two. The first one, again, is what I've talked about a lot, and is My Brother's Husband by Gengoro of Takame. This deals with the... Our, he's not our main character, but Mike Flanagan is a Canadian man who is dealing with the loss of his husband. And he arrives in Japan to see his, his dead husband's family and get to know them. Um... And it deals with his the Jap his Japanese brother. I forget his name. I read it so long ago. I just remember it starts with an R. But the Japanese brother is dealing with how he was never like 
outwardly super homophobic to his brother, to his twin, but he also wasn't supportive. And so he's dealing with that and he's dealing with Mike Flanagan just being here and Mike Flanagan's relationship with his niece. It is very, very well written. It is very, I love the art style. I love the messaging and all of it. It's just so good. The paperback version, the bind up of both volumes one and two is out. I had to stop myself from picking it up at Barnes and Noble, but I really wanted to. It's floppy, it's big, it's, read it. It's so good. I also wanted to take this moment to shout out Check Please by Ngozi Ukazu because the sequel is about to come out. I think this is also available on like Webtoon or a web platform somewhere you can read it. You don't have to buy these physically. So this is again a perfect situation in case you wanted something because you can read these online. You don't have to buy them. It's free. But <laughs> I wanted to shout this out because like I said the sequel is coming out soon. Um, and because it's one of those things that's going to be affected by Corona, like people, you might not be able, like the events for that are being canceled and stuff. So this is cute. It's a sports thing. It's very much like Fence, but I think better. It's more fast paced. Things actually happen. You don't have to wait. Like Fence is like on its third volume now. There's been like 300 pages of Fence and nothing has happened. Stuff is happening here. It's very cute. Eric Biddle is a is a forever mood. Like, I would dare you to find a more relatable person than Miss Eric Biddle. You will not find it because he is he is king. Um, the slow burn is excellent, and like I said, it's just great. So I do recommend this, and again, it's a free one. So we're ending this on a really good note. <laughs> so at the end of the day. Here are my Corona-a-thon recommendations. In all seriousness, though, please be, be, be out here taking care of yourself, guys. Like, wash your hands. If you don't need to be out in public, do not be out in public. Um, if you have to be out in public, don't be getting close to people. Do the social distancing. Don't be, like, six feet if you can help it. I understand that sometimes you can't. You know, we all don't live in the suburbs. Some of y'all be living in these like cramped cities. You gotta make do with what you got. Um, listen to your elected officials, to the health officials. Like, don't come to me for medical advice. Go, go to people who know what they're talking about. All I can do is say, wash your hands. That's all I know is to wash your hands and to practice social distancing. So that's what I'm gonna be doing. Not with these, cause I've already read all of these, but I have a stack of books that I haven't read from the library. Um, that I'm gonna try and get to. So, thanks for watching this. Please do not be offended by anything. Like I said, this is very much like a tongue-in-cheek, but also I really liked these books, and I think that I wanted to talk about a lot of these, so that's what this is. But, um, thanks for sitting through this. I'll see you guys again soon in another video. But until then, and until next time, stay safe, be healthy. Bye.